Hi, and welcome to Deer IQ, where smart hunting begins. I'm Adam Lewis, 20 plus year educator, 30 plus year deer hunter, untastefully seasoned outdoor writer, and I'm here to help you achieve what we all hope for, to be truly greater deer hunters. This is part three in our series, Public Land Hunting Mastery, and asking the question, is public land hunting ruined? Today we're with the well-known and highly successful public land hunter and author, John Eberhardt. And I ask him some tough questions about what he feels public land hunters need to do to be successful in this new era of an increasingly pressured hunting landscape. As we start, I want to challenge you to do a couple of things. First, download our free journal to use with this podcast. That's really going to help. And second, as you do that, here are the top look-fors or things to look for during this episode. What changes has John seen during his long career public land hunting and what does he feel caused this? What are four things he highlights that highly successful public land hunters do that others do not? What does John think is the solution to competing with other hunters? And a change John is making now and in the future to improve and have more productive hunts. And there's a ton more in there in my conversation with John, so that is just the tip of the iceberg. So take good notes and pay attention. And I have a few challenges at the end that I believe will truly take your hunting skills up several notches. So make sure to stay tuned and listen for that. And now let's get to the podcast and up your deer IQ. All right, I'm here with John Eberhart. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate the offer. It's great to have you on. Um, Many of you listeners will probably know John. He's not a stranger to podcasts uh, in general, but a few might not really know who he is. And um, we're going to jump into today uh, a question I think a lot of people have been talking about, and it is public land hunting in kind of a new, what I call ultra pressured terrain, kind of the post COVID. And the big question I pose is public land hunting, is it ruined? Uh, I think it's definitely changed, and we're going to get John's opinion on that. But John, before we dig into that, could you just give us an intro? Um, if guys don't know who you are, uh, just who you are, what you've done, kind of your resume of sorts. Sure, I can do that. Uh, my name is John Eberhard. I am from Michigan. I've been bow hunting since 1965, and um Michigan's a two buck state and it is the most heavily bow hunted state in the country. So it's an extremely pressured state. And I have exclusively hunted on either public land or knock on doors for free permission properties all of my life, whether I hunt out of state or in Michigan. I've hunted 18 different parcels of public land in Michigan. I've taken deer off 14 of those public properties. Uh, One of them was a state record, and I think it was the only state record that's ever been taken in Michigan from public land. Um, And I kind of quit bow hunting in 19, or I mean, I quit gun hunting in 1991. So I've also been hunting out of state since 1997. I've got 34 bucks with bow in the Michigan record book, which I think is the most bow kills of anybody in the state and out of state i've taken 20 pope and young bucks on my 25 out of state hunts and that's from 14 different properties the 34 bucks from michigan they came off of um from 11 different counties and out of night off 19 different properties so you know a lot of hunters have stuff in the books from one or two spectacular pieces of property, but I move around. I hunt different places all the time, always gaining permission and not free permission and losing it. And um, so something that I'm extremely proud of, um, there's thousands of guys that have multiple, you know, record book bucks, whether they've had them in the record books or not. But um, I'm really proud of the fact that I've taken 54 book bucks um, between Michigan and my out-of-state hunts, and they've all came off public land and knock on doors for free permission properties. I've never owned anything. I've never leased anything. I've never hunted on a managed property. I've never hunted over a food plot. I've never hunted on a relative's property, and I've never paid a dime to hunt any place in my life. So 
Um, I, I honestly don't think there's another bow hunter in the country that can state that. You know, most people hunt on private property. They kill multiple book uh, bucks. So I'm really, really proud of that. And I, I have written three books along with my son who passed away of cancer a couple years ago. Um, we wrote three instructional bow hunting books that have also uh, uh, produced three instructional bow hunting DVDs. They're a little outdated because they were from 2005. And I'm in the process of writing my last book. Uh, probably be out next year. Um, and I do whitetail workshops in the spring. I usually do three whitetail workshops, limited to 15 people per per uh, per shop. And I only do three of them. And that's about it. I'm married and have four children now and uh, retired and just living the life. <laughs> and, ju- and just got a dog. <laughs> and, and just got a dog, a border dog. Yeah. And, you know, so a lot of people know you for your success on public land uh, is one of the biggies. Um, and also, you didn't mention just the, the saddle hunting. You're kind of seen yeah. as the guy, maybe the father of saddle hunting, which is a huge, huge thing right now. So um, so that's John. And so we're going to dig into uh, in this Can segment. Can I talk about that for a second, Adam? Yeah. Okay, because I didn't mention that. I bet, yeah, I've been, I started saddle hunting in 1981. I walked into Jay's Sporting Goods, actually, and uh, there was this plastic bag full of nylon straps on the wall. It looked like a bunch of seatbelt fabric in this bag, poly bag, and nobody knew what it was. Nobody hunted out of a saddle back then. It was called a tree sling. And, uh, but I looked at the packaging and the hang tag, the header card, and it showed a guy being able to move 360 degrees around the tree. He could hunt as many trees as he wanted to out of and only 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 one saddle all of his life it's fabric so it never makes noise um it you know you can physically wear it in the woods it's just got so many advantages over tree stands and yeah i that i actually have chapters in every book including the new book i'm writing on saddle hunting it's going to be a little bit saddle hunting oriented because i think it's such a huge advantage and uh, for hunters that are blue collar hunters that are hunting public lands being able to run and gun uh, and, you know, have as many locations as they want, uh, it's a huge, huge advantage over tree stands. Most tree stand hunters um, that are really successful have their own properties, so they really don't have the desire or the need to go to a saddle. But for somebody that's just running and gunning and hunting public land and under a lot of competition, um, that gives you a competitive edge over anybody that's using a tree stand. Right. All right. So... Talking about public land hunting here, um, and again, getting back to kind of the question I posed, um, new approaches, and this is kind of the topic, new approaches to ultra-pressured terrain and kind of how I see it. And so, John, I want to pose this question to you to get started here. Um, You've been hunting a long time on public lands. What changes have you seen take place in public land hunting in your career and what is your analysis of where we're at today? Um, and I'd say kind of in this post-COVID landscape, like what, what, what are some of your take on that? What have you seen change? Well, obviously when I started bow hunting in the 60s, there was very, very few bow hunters. So you could basically knock on somebody's door and get free permission just about any place. They wouldn't let you gun hunt in Michigan because we had about a million gun hunters at the time. But bow hunting was easy. So uh, over time... You know, when the compounds came out in the early to mid 70s, which is when they became pretty pop, started becoming popular, bow hunting really took off. A lot more people started bow hunting. So then there was a lot more people, kids of property owners or, you know, whatever, mm-hmm. where it was harder to get permission on, on uh, private property. So, you know, I started hunting a lot more public. And it's, it's just gotten worse every year. And there's been so many changes over the year to the amount of hunters and the type of hunting they're doing. You know, back in the day, I'm a huge security cover oriented guy. Everything I do in Michigan is based on security cover. You know, I'm I'm primarily on public lands. I'm in bedding area. I'm in security cover. And I'd I'd go back and I'd find these islands and cattail marshes or in these marsh grass bog type prop type areas. And now because you had to do all that on foot. 
you know, you had to physically go in a swamp or go in a cattail marsh with waders and find that. You know, I may see a treetop sticking up in the middle of a 20-acre cattail marsh on public land in southern Michigan, and I had to put waders on and see what it was. You know, now with aerials and online stuff, you can see where all that stuff is. So that's been a major change. The hunting public has definitely created uh, more public land hunters. I, I actually know guys that have access to good private land, and they were shooting decent bucks on private, and they are actually converting some of their time over to public because they want the challenge. Because on private managed property, it's not that big of a challenge to kill a mature buck. Whereas on public, if you're hunting in you know a, one of the northeastern states, you know, in New York, or Virginia, West Virginia, Michigan, Pennsylvania, states with high populations and a lot of people that are stuck on public land, it, it's really, really difficult. And a lot of people are, have started bow hunting because of the hunting public. And then other guys I do know, and it's a, it's a small percentage, have left private to hunt public, believe that or not. That's hard to even comprehend. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like an attitude um, has changed of... When I was a kid, even, you know, I'm, I'm in my early 40s. When I was a kid, like, public land was kind of like a place you didn't want to go. And you avoided, right? If you had private, like, that's where you wanted to hunt. And now it's like almost uh, like a, a trophy. If you can get something on public, it's like a big deal. And it's become a little faddish. And when you, you're you talking about the hunting public, the, the group, right? The guys on YouTube, yeah. Um, have really popularized the idea. And also, you know, YouTube, podcasts um, in general have just increased that exposure um, to it as well. But yeah, when you think about it, um, and I was talking to some other guests about this, the the idea of being able to pull up, you know, have a phone mm -hmm. that you can see everything uh, very easily has kind of leveled the playing field uh, as far as who who knows what's where and at least showing where these secret spots are now, right? Yeah. Um, and, for example, um, where I hunt, and we're both in Michigan for listeners, I uh, checked out some spots this late winter, early spring, right? Uh, and I thought I was going way back in, you know, and I was as far as I could go from roads. And you get back there, and a lot of times I'm finding you find tree stands. You saw, you find uh, even, you know, canoes pulled up or where you can see where guys have been coming in. And so it's almost like way back in has become the destination point now. Um, so it's just become harder because uh, access, in a way, has become maybe a little easier. Visual access of isolated areas have become much, much easier. And yeah. Yeah, actually, in my books and when I do podcasts, I always mention when hunting public land in Michigan, not out of state, not when I go to Kansas or Iowa or Ohio, because uh, it's not as pressured. But in Michigan, I kind of have a standing rule. If I can walk to a location standing up, I won't hunt it. I don't care if there's 50 scrapes there and well, 2,000 buck rubs, and they are all look like it's mature bucks, because if I can walk to it, other hunters are going to find it. Other hunters are going to mess it up well, well before season even opens with their preseason scouting and still maybe getting visited. It's all going to be after dark. Right. So on that vein, I guess, um, what are some new challenges you're seeing or maybe foresee in, in the future? Like as this pressure increases and, you know, also adding to that, it, it seems like, and uh, chime in on this, John, um, but private land access is decreasing, it seems like. Um, and so that's pushing more people to have to hunt public. Not only is it popular now, but then other guys have to because they can't get access anymore. So what are some, uh, I guess, challenges you foresee uh, in, the, in the future as well? Well, the, the TV guys have got a lot to do with that because back in the mid-90s, the TV shows became prevalent. And, you know, then everybody's targeting, you know, big mature bucks. So uh, more and more people, obviously, most people want to make it as easy as possible. So they're buying and leasing up land and keeping everybody out. So it's much harder to get free permission. So you're stuck on public land, uh, which is, in my opinion, the ultimate challenge. If you can't kill, I don't want to hear how good you are if you can't kill bucks on public land in a pressured area. 
I don't want to hear how good you are. If you can't do something against competition, it's meaningless to me. Uh, but that's just my mindset. But, um, yeah, the, the TV guys have have kind of put that everybody wants to kill big bucks now. You know, you take your phones out, who's got or competing against, who's got the biggest picture of a motion camera deer before season or what they killed. And it's just it's just changed because now it's almost turning into a European type hunting where, you know, the wealthier people have access to the better properties. But that's just reality and that's it's not going to change. Right. Yeah, I recently was um I think on a Facebook group or something where different guys were, uh, it was a Kansas group, I think. And a lot of them were, a lot of the locals, the Kansas guys were complaining about all the, uh, increased pressure and all the guys from out of state leasing Kansas land and all this stuff. And they were complaining about it pretty hardcore. And, uh, I might've made a comment and they didn't like it, but, um, I was just, you know, it's reality. Like, how are you going to stop that now? You know, so that is our reality. Uh, pressure's going up for a variety of reasons. Um, popularity, uh, less access to private areas. And the interesting thing is that still, at least last year, I think NDA come out, came out with this report that I think it's around 90% of deer are still taken on private land. Uh, so you got increased pressure, but still, I mean, it's still difficult, right? Still, most of them are taken on private. Um, but we have this trend, right? This trend toward the, the normal guy um, might have limited private access to none, and that's not going to uh, get any better. And so we're forced to hunt public. Um, w- when we do that, you know, what what are some of the biggest mistakes, John? You've been doing a long time that you see guys making um, when they go to hunt public land uh, that, you know, we can easily fix? What are some of these big mistakes um, from your perspective? Uh, I'm going to fall back on the TV guys a little bit. Uh, There's so many guys that hunt public land that are novice hunters, and I'm sure you would agree with that. You know, I'd I'd say at least 20 to 30 percent of most public land hunters are relatively green, okay? So what do they typically do? They watch YouTube videos or they watch TV shows, and that's where they get a good percentage of their hunting methods from. So when you watch TV shows, you see mature bucks coming out into short crop fields or walking through open timber with no understory security cover. So, you know, when I scout public land, no matter where I'm at, you'll see most of the tree stands, most of the prepped hunting locations for mother hunters is in pretty much open areas where mature bucks, if you're after mature bucks, they just don't move on pressured properties. They don't move in open areas during daylight hours. Mm-hmm. You may see rubs and scrapes in there, but if it's planted by a mature buck, it's in the security of darkness. So um, they, they tend to follow what TV guys do. They rattle in the same manner. If they do rattle, but too aggressively, um, they just make a lot of mistakes. Scent control to me is a monster mistake. Most people, most people do. And to me, when you're hunting public land, you should be extremely security cover oriented. I can't stress the word security cover enough because if you're not hunting in an area where there's adequate transition security cover to the location you're physically hunting at, and perimeter security cover around the area you're hunting at, the kill zone, your odds of killing a mature buck in a pressured area on public land are real close to zero. Mature yeah. bucks that are at least three and a half years old, they've been through two seasons of gun season, and usually bow hunting pressure is doubled during gun season. And those guys during gun season, as you well know, they're more apt to shoot any legal antler buck. They're not as selective as bow hunters are. So there's just a lot of things against um, public land hunting, and a lot of it is the methodology and the way a majority, in my opinion, even though I say it's 20 to 30 percent, I think over 50 percent. Because usually when I'm scouting, well over half of the stands I see are in open areas where I wouldn't, I would walk right through. I wouldn't even think of putting a stand there if I'm after a mature buck. If you just want to kill a deer, yeah, but if you want to kill a mature buck, you've got to be security cover oriented. I usually in Michigan, I'm crossing rivers with waders or creeks or crossing a lake with a 
canoe. And like you mentioned earlier, those access areas now because of Onyx and aerial photos and stuff are open to everybody. They can find that. They don't have to work to find it anymore. It's right there in front of them. Right. It's just a question of will they do the work to get back there, basically. Right. Yeah, and by security cover, and that is a good distinction. Like, uh, you can probably go on state land and shoot a deer. Now, right. it, it in general, is harder than private. I'll just say that. Um, but you could shoot a doe. You could shoot a younger buck. Um, maybe in some of these more open areas, even then it, it still is tougher, but yes. mature bucks. So you usually, I think are saying three and a half or older, they've been around several years. And when you talk about security cover, just to, I guess, define that for guys listening, um, in my experience, this is stuff that's, I mean, it's hard to walk through. It's hard to see through. It's hard to shoot through. Like you're struggling to find areas to have shots basically um, for deer to feel secure um, and you just need a hole here or there that you can uh, basically weave an arrow through for uh, bucks mature bucks to feel secure right to feel safe enough to move in daylight and i've noticed that before even uh i remember years ago um i was i think it was late season like muzzle loader i was out and these were just does so these are they had does and fawns, um, and these are weren't even like mature bucks. But the does would not leave this heavy slash cover. Um, they would not leave it. I, there's no way I could have shot one. I had a doe permit. I couldn't have shot one with the muzzleloader. It was so thick, and they were feeding around in it. And they would not. They would get to the edge, and then they'd stop. They would not leave it at all. But the fawns would kind of go outside of it because they're dumb, right? Yep. So there's there's no way these mature deer that have been around more than a year on public land, they really will stick to that cover. Uh, and that's what you're talking about, the security cover. And so finding a way to hunt within that. Hi, this is Adam Lewis with DeerIQ.com, and this is your High IQ Moment. Do you know how to find a sanctuary that holds big bucks on public land? Well, a second tip is to look for hard-to-access areas. This is a cliche, but true. These do not have to be way back deep, however, but need to be in areas that are free from human intrusion. If you find human sign like boot tracks, fresh flagging tape, stands, or worn trails, then move on because the deer will not stay here, especially big bucks, which do not tolerate human intrusion, no matter how good it looks. Water, hills, cliffs, blowdowns, and thick tangles you can't walk through all create barriers, so look for these. Also, in your search, make sure that old deer sign doesn't deceive you either, like a rub that is weeks old or an abandoned scrape that has been hunted and blown out by another hunter. Read the full article on keys to find buck sanctuaries, link below, and get our free public land hunting guide with detailed new strategies to beat the crowds and still find success even in this crazy, pressured new landscape we find ourselves in. And do you know your deer IQ? Do you think you're deer smart? Why don't you take the deer IQ test and find out? It's fun and easy, and you'll find it below. Okay, and now let's get back to the podcast. Yeah, 28 of my 34 Michigan bucks in the record book. And I've shot a lot more than 34, but 34 that are in the book. 28 of them had, had old wounds on them. One of them had as many as four, four projectiles in his body when I shot him. He's a five and a half year old. Uh, yes, yeah, security cover is really easy to define. If you're walking through some public land, you have, this is the way I put it in my head, or the way I at least say it on a podcast. You have to pretend every person that's hunting on this property is trying to kill you. Where are the only places on this property where you think you might go and feel secure enough to get up and move during daylight hours? Yeah. And typically, when you're hunting public land, you may slop a mature buck in on opening day when they are possibly are still in their summer pattern. But usually the preseason scouting and location prep by most hunters have turned bucks on heavily pressured public land nocturnal well before season, at least two or three weeks before season. So your odds on public land of getting an opportunity at a mature buck prior to the rut phases when 
testosterone levels rise and bucks start thinking with other parts of their body than their brain, um, your odds of getting a mature buck to move during daylight hours are very slim. But even during the rut phases, you've got to be back in that security cover. And if you try to pretend everybody's trying to kill you, where the only places you may move, you know, go to and get up and move during daylight hours, because a buck can bed just about any dang place. And as long as he's not going to get up in the daytime, he's probably going to be pretty dang safe. But obviously, you got to get to a place where the adequate security cover is there for him to feel comfortable moving during daylight hours. And you have to feel the same way because bucks have been shot at in the heavily pressured areas. They've been shot at. They've probably been wounded. They know the gig. They know the influx of human activity means, so, okay, it's time for me to get back in the heavy security cover and not move during daylight hours until my testosterone kicks in and forces me to because I want to breathe. Right. What are some... Uh... So security cover is one huge thing. Um, what are some habits uh, you would say or mindsets that successful public land hunters have that maybe those that aren't have? What's a distinction there other than, okay, um, finding that really, really thick cover? And I will say um, that when you really get down to it and start looking at it, there's there's less than you think. Some of these public land areas are pretty big, uh, at least in Michigan, there's some pretty big chunks here and there. But when you really get down to where a deer, a mature deer can move in daylight, it really starts narrowing it down for you. Um, But what are some... Let me throw something in there really fast while you said that, because there's many times, I've hunted on 18 different parcels of public. I probably scouted 30. And the other ones, when I scout it, if there's no place that I feel like a mature buck would be and move during daylight hours, I turn around and leave. I don't set anything up. I abandon it permanently. It's a scout it and leave and don't ever come back. So if it doesn't have the adequate security cover for daytime movement by a mature buck, I'm not even going to waste my time hunting there. So I just had to throw that in real quick. Yeah. Not so- all properties are conducive for daytime movements by mature bucks in pressured areas right or maybe just a small segment of it and finding that is you know part of the key um what are some habits and mindsets that you see successful public land hunters having versus those that aren't successful uh i think security cover is probably the biggest one most successful public land hunters um gravitate to security cover at least in pressured areas um Dan Infault, for instance, you know, he's a bedding area guy. I'm a huge bedding area guy. Uh, most of the guys, I, most of my friends that hunt public lands, they know they have to be in the crap to kill good bucks. Now, when I go out west, you know, Kansas and Iowa and hunt public lands out there, those bucks out there, because there's so much less pressure, they will move through open areas during daylight hours. So it's not the same, you know, out there where the hunting public guys are hunting, they're hunting in Nebraska's and Iowa's and Missouri's and Kansas's and the Dakota's where there's not near the pressure. So, you know, they can get away with hunting in a little bit more open areas than you can, you know, in heavily pressured states up in the Northeast. Um, but gravitating to security cover, I, I think that is the number one thing to me. Uh, entry and exit routes, a lot of hunters just willy nilly go in, you know, and they don't care how they're walking in and they, they're spooking deer coming in or spooking deer coming out. Um, they don't use the proper daily and seasonal timing. It's, it's rare that I'm hunting on public land outside of the rut phases. So if you got a location on public land, even if it's back in some good security cover, if you're burning it out during the October lull when mature bucks are not moving in the daytime, you're altering your doe traffic. And if you're altering doe traffic, let's say it's at a white oak tree or, or at an apple tree, lost apple tree out in the out in the woods. Uh, if you're altering the doe traffic coming into that, well, then obviously when you go back and hunt it during the rut phases, the mature bucks aren't going to come in there in the daytime because you've altered the daytime doe activity at that location. Right. So hunting it at the wrong time of season a lot of locations are morning locations a lot of locations are you know mast and fruit trees are evening locations because you, otherwise you spook deer with your entry so hunting it at the wrong time of day and at the wrong time of season um and and to me scent control scent control uh, other than the security cover 
um, I, I struggle to comprehend why more people don't pay attention to scent control and hunt where you don't have to pay attention to wind. Because I pay attention, I haven't paid attention to wind in over twenty years, and I yeah. never ever get winded. And well, we'll, we'll get there. we'll get to that scent control stuff here. Well, uh, you're asking later what on, for, and that's definitely one of them. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that later, but. Yeah, a couple of things you mentioned there I, I wrote down. Um, and one is this idea of burnout. Like, was, And I see this a lot because I hunt a lot of public here in Michigan. And it's frustrating because there's a lot of guys out there. And I see these guys, um, and, and you mentioned it earlier, like that first few days, I've noticed you can actually maybe get a crack at a good buck yeah. before he catches on to being hunted. Once those first few days are gone, it, you got to change, right? It's over. <laughs> but I, I noticed that a lot of guys immediately are going to the deepest spots, like first day. And it, it's frustrating to me because that is immediately educating every deer uh, in that public land area um, right off the bat. Like they, they, they won't like kind of ease into it. It's just like immediate burnout. So it's, it's, challenging i think and maybe speak to this if you have a uh some wisdom or tactic to this but other people are even if you're not doing it yep. other people might be so there's this balance of how aggressive should i be uh because there's other people in the mix too that are changing the movements and educating deer quickly because of what they're doing right yep. And you have to also keep in mind, if you see another hunter and he's going back in deep by an opening day, he's already been there prepping his location. So he's already made that intrusion. Right. Um, when I, when I, when I prep my locations, it's always in the spring. It's always, I'm totally done with all my prep location for the year by the end of April. So the cool thing about postseason scouting and location preparation is you are looking at the woods before there's any foliage on the trees. So you're looking at the ground foliage, you're there, the ground cover, you can actually see how dense the cover actually is. You can look in the trees and see what you're gonna look like up in this tree, because when you come back on it during the rut, there's not gonna be any leaves in it either. Right. So you're looking at the area as well as the tree exactly in the same manner as it's gonna look when you come back and hunt it during the rut phases. When you go in and you pre-season scout, everything's green. There's foliage everywhere, everywhere. Everything looks dense. It looks like there's security cover all over. The ferns are up. The weeds are up. The trees are in full leaf foliage. And you may prep a location that you think has adequate security cover. And then when you come back in during the rut and the foliage is down, it there is no security cover. All the foliage is down. And now there's not the ground security cover that you thought there were. Let's say you prepped a tree and you're up there 18 feet because when you prepped it, when the foliage was on the tree, you had lots of background cover. But when you go there and all the foliage is down during the rut phases, you stick out like a sore thumb because you're so low that you're, you're still within their peripheral vision. So how hunters prep it, and um, I, I guess when you're talking about other hunters going in, I it's rare that I hunt public land first day or two a season i'm usually on i have two free permission parcels of private that's typically where i'm at because most public lands locations to me are already screwed up before deer season even starts because so many hunters are in there preseason scouting and prepping locations and just you know doing general deer hunting work uh, right. it's already turned the bucks i want to kill nocturnal so i i start keying on my public land locations around 25th of october unless i got i do need to throw this in because two years ago i shot a buck this way um i do have public land areas bedding areas where during the october lull let's say you know october 5th through october 20th you know when most bucks are pretty much nocturnal on public land where i will go into a bedding area strictly on the morning hunts you know, I'm in my tree about an hour and a half to two hours before daylight, settled in, and I will do rattle sequences. It's not a place where I'm going to go back and hunt during the rut, but it's a place I had scouted 
And I said, okay, this is a good location to come in and do some sparring sequences, which is a light rattling sequences because I'm physically in a bedding area and it's not a spot I'm going to come back and hunt during the rut. So it's a free hunt. This is a free hunt because I'm not coming back later to hunt it again. So I'm not screwing anything up. And uh, two years ago, I shot a really nice eight point on public land by going in in the morning. I shot him at eight o'clock. I did a rattle sequence at seven. 50 and another one at 7.55, and he came right in on the second one. So those are free hunts. But typically on public land, I'm I'm going in on public land during the rut phases to my bedding area locations. Right. I think a key distinction there is, um, and I see a lot of guys have like one or two spots, like, and that's it. That's what they hunt. Um, I have over 40 every year. Right, yeah. And it's... To me, like I, I, I kind of know, and you, I think public land hunting, and more in the future, you have to get in the mentality that yeah, spots are going to get screwed up. You're going to run into other guys. Oh, um, it, it just happens, and in my mind, it's like half the time my hunts might get screwed up. Mm-hmm. I just have to know that going in, um, and have so many spots that I always have a plan B, a plan C these different locations that I can quickly go to have trees prepped, know how I'm going in, how I'm getting out to all these spots. And it's a lot of work, but over years you start accumulating these and uh, it just leaves you more options uh, to where you just don't, aren't destroyed by, Oh, somebody moved in on me and that's it. That was my spot. You know, other hunters messing you up is to be expected. Yeah. Heavily on a public land. And that's another really cool thing about a saddle because I, I'll have forty to fifty trees ready to go on either private or public, and I hunt all of them with one saddle. So I'm not making any noise. You know, if I go to a spot and I'm toting a tree stand back in my tree stand days in the seventies, if I want to go to another spot, I'm toting this cumbersome tree stand, and because everything is security cover oriented, you're catching the metal things on brush and branches and. You know, and it's noisy and it's cumbersome and it makes you sweat and you swear at it and because it's catching up on stuff. So the saddle actually is a huge, huge deal breaker on public land because you can have so many trees ready and you just walk from one to the next, whichever one you feel is best. And by by having 40 or 50 trees every year, and I've been doing that for 30 years, um, I may only hunt 12 of them during the course of the season, 15 at the most. Because, you know, a lot of them are food-based trees for early early season hunting. Or they, they're primary scrape area trees that I've scouted out. So when I go to the spot, obviously I do a speed tour prior to season to check to see if the oaks are dropping acorns, what kind of buck signs there, if it is, or if the apple trees are dropping a- apples, or if the primary scrape areas or scrape areas that I scouted out are active, uh, you know, During the course of the year, well over half of the trees I'm not going to hunt because from year to year, mass changes, fruit drop changes, scrape areas change. If you're hunting private, uh, crop rotations change where the scrape areas are going to be. You know, there's always changes from year to year. Right. Good to have options. All the more options you have, the better. Yep. And cool point. (laughs) Right. And yeah, you you can't physically hunt all those in one season. Right. Uh, But you have them and. you know, and this is maybe another point for guys, is however you do this. I have an Excel kind of sheet, uh, and guys can do it on their phone now with apps and stuff and make notes. But you have the spots. You have them categorized by maybe time of year or when they hunt best. And you have these notes in there um, that you can, okay, you know, this is the situation. It's October lull, whatever. Uh, these are some stands I can hunt in these situations. And you, you just have a, a whole uh, set of these uh, potentially good locations, and you're not hunting these spots where you don't feel like uh, there's much of a chance. Um, and that's uh, back, get back to the, gets back to the prep work. Adam, John, there's nothing that beats planning and preparation. You know, if you look at a successful business person, they're usually good planners, and they're good at pre- preparation. And hunting is no different. You're not going to be, if you're hunting public land, you're not going to do any better than your plan is or your work ethic is. 
uh, managed properties like TV guys, it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to kill your big bucks, period. Don't matter if you're a good owner or a bad owner, it's going to happen. So, but on public land, how your work ethic is, how successful you are in knowing seasonal daily timing for each location, having multiple location options, all that stuff makes a big difference in success rates. Yeah, yeah. I just, I just wrote, I think, an article about this where I made the statement basically that if you, let's say, make a mistake when you're hunting, it probably can be traced back to some sort of lack of preparation or planning on your part. Yep. Most of the time, I would think. Um, so to kind of wrap up this segment, John, we, we might have touched on a lot of these already, but um, again, looking toward the future, you know, in public land hunting, uh, it's getting more and more pressured. What are some things that have worked well for you in the past? And we've talked about some of those, but what are some, are you going to make any tweaks to these, uh, I guess, strategies for the future in public land hunting? Uh, what might that look like? Uh, one of the tweaks I've been doing lately is I've been doing a lot more rattle sequences in bedding areas during the lull. Uh, last year I shot one of my bucks on, uh, I rattled him in out of a standing cornfield. So, and that was October 15th during the lull. So I'm, I'm learning, I've never been a good lull hunter, you know, that mid October time frame. I've kind of always left that alone, but as long as I can go in and hunt locations, where I'm not interfering with my rut phase locations, so I consider them free hunts. I'm doing a lot more of that. So that's one thing I'm changing. I'm doing more lull hunting in heavy security cover, which a cornfield is heavy security cover, obviously. Um, as far as the other stuff, I totally agree with what you said earlier. You know, places where, where I used to have to wear waders to go in and stuff, now when I go in those places and scout them in the spring, you know, re reprep them somewhat and clean up a little bit of vegetation that was of summer growth from the previous year, even though you're not supposed to. Um, I, I definitely see more sign of other, other hunters back in those areas because they can find them. So I don't have to worry about it as much as you do because I'm 72 and I'm going to be dead in a few years, <laughs> but I, I can't see any other alterations that I'm going to be making. I pretty much got my routine for hunting public lands down pretty well. I think I've got it pretty well planned out. Um, but I do find myself doing more mid-October bow hunting and doing rattle and sparring sequences or possibly using a decoy or something in areas that I'm not going to go back to during the rough phase. Yeah, and those might be places, just you know, thinking out loud here, but those might be places that the deer got kind of pushed to with the initial oh, initial pressure but they yeah, haven't uh, haven't yep. been pounded yet by the rut hunters right exactly. so yep. that yeah that might be a great tactic and time to pick up on those bucks that are they're slightly pressured but they haven't been pounded in those areas yet by yep. the you know the rut and you have to do it in the morning so that they they have to be morning hunts because you got to get in their way before they're going to transition into the bedding area because they're going to transition into the bedding area before daylight you got to be in there a couple hours before daylight and set up so that they're not going to catch you. Right. So as we wrap up, here are some key high IQ takeaways and challenges. First, grade yourself on how you are doing in the four areas John highlighted to be a highly successful public land hunter. Pick one area you will improve on now and one action you will take to do that. Second, check out John's YouTube channel called Eberhard Outdoors where he has some real good instructional videos and you can get more tips right from John. And if you like this podcast, consider rating it, commenting on it, giving a review, and sharing it with a hunting buddy. That really helps the podcast grow and it's greatly appreciated. Okay, and next time we'll continue with a Michigan public land hunter that chased a 180 inch giant for five years. And we'll look at just how he closed in on him. It's a great episode. You won't want to miss it. And I'll see you then.